We have two. We've got Dr. Colin Mumford, Technical Support Manager for Bayer Crop Science, and Andrew, sorry, yes, Andrew Wilson, who's Technical Manager at ICL. I think, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we've all heard lots of the pressures um, that growers are under from plant health. I just thought I'd take it back to the nursery and just show some of the issues and some of the, the tools available to, to deal with it. Um, I just thought I'd start off with this sort of slide just to highlight the sort of issues um, facing growers. Obviously, if, if we look at the um, approved products available um, to growers, they, they, they decreased by sort of 80% over the last 20 years. And obviously, that, that will continue. So obviously, we'll go through how, how growers can cope with this and how we, how we move forward on the basis of all these um, increasing problems that, that, um, that arise. Um, I mean, plant protection products are very rigorously tested and you know, lots of safety assessments are made before they're released. But obviously, um, the regulatory framework has become increasingly challenging to existing plant protection products and product innovation. And it's really driven by three factors. Um, obviously, the approval process at the EU level. And we've heard from Anthea McIntyre about the machinations of the, of the process and you know, the, the agreements between the different member countries to come up with um, proposals. So obviously, it can be a compromise and it has effects on the products available to us. Um, one of the biggest things affecting products available to UK growers has been the implementation of the Water Framework Directive, which is obviously looking at water quality right through to beaches and rivers and all sorts of water, uh, drinking water. Uh, and that's had an effect on the products available and obviously products have been taken off the market as a result of that. Um, and more recently, there's been some restrictions on neonicotinoid products um, due, due to concerns over bee safety and some of those products have been taken off the market, other products have been heavily restricted in their use. Um, and if we, if we come up to date, um, there's been a recent um, Anderson report by the Crop Protection Association, and of the 250 actives that are left in the market, um, up to 87 of them are at threat, um, and at least 40 are likely to be lost. And they're across the range of products available in the market, um, probably about 16 herbicides, maybe, maybe 10 or 12 fungicides, maybe 10 insecticides. So it, it's quite a serious issue um, to look at. Um, horticulture s suffers in another way, really, um, compared to the broad acre combinable crops in the agricultural sector. The actual areas of, of the crops grown are much smaller. Now, when you look at the value um, of this, uh, of the horticultural sectors, that they're very high, but, but on paper the areas used are quite small. Um, and they often have very specific pests and diseases. Um, we've seen some of the pressures with some of the, you know, the new um, fungi and bacteria affecting UK plants. Um, but many of the crops re rely on extensions of use from maybe an agricultural label um, to give, give use on these specialist crops, um, rather than full label approvals. This does make them a little bit more sen sensitive to being lost and a case has to be made to get these extensions for minor crops. And it, it's all very important that you the growers um, highlight where there's gaps and then the, the relevant trade organisations and people like the um, AWHD can, can obviously put forward for these extensions. But it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's a difficult area. Um, but obviously, any, any gaps in resistance you know, can lead to over-reliance on particularly fungicides and then lack of an effective control program. Um, uh, it's already been discussed a bit about you know, why there's more disease pressure. I don't think there is one answer. But obviously, we've seen from some of the slides from Italy and Corsica and everywhere that plants are coming from all over the world um, and increased globalisation um, the constant search for new plants obviously has an effect. 
um, the climate change and the very warm winters in, in the Black Isle are obviously having a big effect um, from what we hear. Um, but climate change, not just in temperatures, but rainfall, there's, there's lots of more extreme effects. And, and it can be simply um, increased rainfall in, in summer periods, you know, can, can bring much more um, susceptibility to, to fungi, things like Phytophthora, that can, can become more of an issue. Um, there's also an increasing specialisation and intensification of crops. You know, nurseries are getting larger. Um, there's more marketing of specific crops. There's lots of breeding of new varieties, often bred for an innovative flower colour or dwarf habit, which you know, might also lead to weaker plants that are more susceptible. Um, it may not be one of the key breeding things, pl plant resistance. Um, there's also an increased use of protective structures, so a lot of stock can be forced on to get it available for certain sales periods and target dates, maybe be it Easter or Mother's Day or something like that. So you can have potentially softer plants. Um, looking at the diseases, I've mentioned Phytophthora already. Um, I've been in the industry a few years and we just used to talk about fungal root rots in a very general way. There's much more technology available now. Um, John Adlam was mentioning about the lateral flow devices. We use them quite, quite regularly to identify Phytophthora and Pythium, and they're a very useful tool. And you know, with less actives available, it's very important that you target the, the correct fungal species. Um, I've had lots of incidences where people have been trying to control Phytophthora or Pythium on a Pyrus crop, for instance, and when we've done some DNA extraction testing, we've actually found out that it was Rhizoctonia or Fusarium. So with that information, you can get a much better control, and it's all about knowledge and learning and taking things forward. But as growers get larger and the crops get bigger, you can focus more on the crops and learn more about the crops and why you're losing them. But you know, losing crops and parts of crops has a big effect on your prof profitability, so it's really important. Um, some of the things we've learned from plants moving around Europe is that, you know, traditionally we thought of Phytophthora cinnamoni as, as the main Phytophthora, but throughout Europe, you know, some of the others are, are more important. Um, Cryptogea and that, you know, is coming in from Italy. So you just need to be aware of that because some of the other Phytophthora are more difficult to control. If you take it to an extreme like Phytophthora and Remorum, it's, it's on a different level. Um, I just put up this picture because I thought it was a good picture. Um, it's already been mentioned about um, protected zone status, and that, that's worked, worked well for larger crops like, you know, like, like potatoes or a major pest like Bemisia. But lots of the crops we're dealing with are much smaller crops, and you know, we don't know about the problem in, until it's arrived. Um, so obviously... Um, the Asian longhorn beetle was an example. And it's another example that the pest may not necessarily arrive with the plant. You know, in, in this case, you know, it was coming in on wood as well and pallets and different things as well. So I see you're concerned about the Xyella and, and how it could develop. So we need to have an open mind about where it could come from and be very cautious about buying plants and, and checking plants and, and following the procedures. Um, and again, Chalara has been mentioned as well. Um, and that's more of a problem that's blown in, I think, as mentioned. But you know, it was quite a known problem in Europe for many years, particularly in Germany. It had been gradually spreading across. I'm not sure what we could have done to stop it, but it, it is a major problem. Um, so looking at challenges for growers, we're going to increasingly get major crop problems where there aren't many solutions to, to control it. Um, vine weevil has had many actives you know, in, in, in the last 10 or 20 years that could control it. Gradually, those have been lost due to their either persistence in the environment or, or concern about neonics and, and, and things, things like that. So effective control is becoming more and more difficult and we have to look at that. There's only a few actives left and a few biological controls. Um, so I'll just pass over to Colin and he's going to talk a little bit about a fine removal control strategy. Right, thank you. Hello everyone, um, today I want to talk about uh, 
vine weevil in particular and the control of it and uh, the different strategies that you can employ. So I want to talk about the cultural, biological and chemical options that you have available to you. So um, all of these methods ideally would all be used as a, an integrated uh, pest management uh, approach. Some of them, depending on the scale of your operation, may or may not be uh, ideal for you. And uh, you'll, you'll see as we, we go ahead. So, uh, cultural practices. Um, basic things that you can do include removing hide, hiding opportunities for the vine weevil, the adult vine weevil. Uh, they come up at a, a night time to, to feed on the plant and during the daylight hours they like to, to hide up. So if you can remove those hiding opportunities, such as removing mulch and the leaf litter from the, from the plant, uh, it's easy, you're easier for you to, to find those adults and to uh, control them accordingly. Now because they come up over night time, that's the ideal opportunity to, to find the, the adults. So if you can go around your plants with the torch, it needs to be a dimly lit torch. If it's too bright, they'll just scurry down the plant and hide up again. But it's, as I say, it's not necessarily an approach that is um, ideal for a large scale operation. But for sm small scale operations, you know, it is a, a cultural practice that is available to you. So you can easily find the adults on the plant uh, pick them off and um, control them as you see fit. Alternatively, applying sticky bands around the trunks of plants. So as they, the adults climb up uh, to, to get to the canopy, they reach the sticky band and, and can't go any further. So these are all like, simple, uh, effective cultural practices. Uh, another one is to, to cover the base of, of the, the plant so that the, the actual adult is uh, stuck in the soil uh, the, the compost, it can't emerge from it and reach the canopy. So these are really you know, simplistic uh, practices that can be take, but they are taken, but they are, are effective, but have li their limitations uh, dependent on the scale of the operation that you have. I want to talk about biological uh, control measures now, and these are basically uh, nematodes, so uh, parasites to, to the, the larvae of the vine weevil and also um, a fungus uh, that can be used. They are very effective but they have their limitations in that the pest actually has to be present for them to be able to work. It's not something you can apply to a plant, uh, to, the, to a compost uh, and then wait for the pest to turn up. Um, then the actual pest, the, the larvae of the vine weevil, is a host for, for the uh, nematode and for the fungus, uh, for, for the nematodes to complete their life cycle. And a nematode has to uh, locate, attach, and then penetrate uh, the vine weevil larvae for it to, to work. But they do work as part of a, a biological control. Uh, other limitations they have is that the you know, soil temperatures have to be right, you've got to have the right moisture content as well. So again, dependent on the scale of your operation uh, would dictate whether or not that's a, a viable option for you. And then finally, uh, chemical control. So we're talking about insecticides. Um, I just want to focus in on this one particular uh, insecticide called Exemptor. It's a, a systemic, uh, granular systemic product. So it's, it's taken in by the plant and transported to all parts of the plant. And then when the, uh, the vine weevil larvae feed on the roots of the, of the plant, that's when they ingest the active ingredient, which is thiocloprid. It's for indoor and outdoor uh, plants, uh, not for um, food crops, but for uh, ornamental plants and hardy nursery stock. And it will control a wide spectrum of pests. This is one particular insecticide. It's very important that you rotate your in insecticides when using them to uh, prevent the potential for resistance to build up uh, in the, the pest that you're trying to control. There are already uh, species that, uh, or strains of species that have become resistant to the various uh, insecticide groups including the pyrethroids, the organophosphorus and carbamate compounds. And thiocloprid uh, will control those, those pests that are resistant to those, those compounds. But as I say, it should be used in rotation with other insecticides. You know, it shouldn't use 
one active ingredient uh, all the time. You should always rotate them. So the, the pests that it will control are the aphids, the, the white flies, glass, glasshouse white flies, uh, the leaf beetles. I haven't got a picture of a leaf beetle, but I'm sure you will know what I'm talking about. The vine weevil and the sciarid fly. And you can get, achieve uh, sustained control with uh, Exemptor. Um, up to 38 weeks control for uh, the vine weevil, so effectively the whole growing season. Uh, and there, there are two uh, rates that it's applied at, 300 grams and 400 grams per cubic metre. And as I say, if you apply it at the right time, you will get effectively uh, season-long control, growing season-long control. It also has a good environmental profile. Uh, it has a short half-life, uh, which is really good. It means it's not going to be hanging around in the environment uh, forever and a day. It, it breaks down uh, re relatively quickly. Uh, it binds very strongly to the uh, compost, so uh, it, that prevents it from uh, being uh, leached out. So that reduces the potential for active ingredients to get into uh, waterways. And it has good uh, margins of safety for, for birds and fish when used in accordance with the label directions. Uh, it also has uh, a favorable, favorable bee safety profile. Um, thiocloprid is a, a neonicotinoid and neonicotinoids get a bad rap. Uh, this particular one, um, bees are able to metabolize it very quickly uh, in their uh, uh, enzyme system and so uh, they're not uh, affected by it. In fact, there's been um, studies, that have, independent studies that have been carried out. Uh, there was a, uh, a large one done by the German authorities on uh, a risk assessment, uh, and they found that, um, that products with thiocloprid uh, were not dangerous to bees. Now that's a quick whistle-stop tour. Uh, it's, as I say, it's important that you use uh, cultural, biological and chemical processes uh, all together, ideally, uh, and that it's very important that you rotate any active ingredients of insecticides that you use. Now I'll, I'll hand you back to uh, Andrew, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll answer them for you later. Thank you, Colin. Um, so just to summarise really about the future, um, to get effective control, um, prevention is easier than cure. Um, and as Colin's saying about cultural controls, you know, plant and nursery hygiene is, is really important. And the quality of your plants you're getting and, and the way you look after them you know, is, is really important. Um, growing systems particularly can have a, have a big effect on the amount of disease you get, not just disease, but weeds as well. So if you update your irrigation, time your irrigation, plan your, plan your irrigation for times of the day when it's not going to provide too much humidity, don't leave the foliage wet overnight. It's easy in this climate, I know. But um, you know, environmental differences, in, particularly in protected structures, can have a big, big difference. Um, you know, careful choice of the varieties you grow can have a big effect as well. So you, you often see growing some varieties, some can be weaker, some always go down with the disease. Why not look for a different variety? Um, you know, that, that can make, make a big difference. You know, it's the, the rule of this world, you know, 90% of your problems come from 10% of the places probably. So you can make life a little bit easier. Um, but a key part, you know, is effective diagnosis of, of the pest and disease. And there's, there's a lot of information around. Um, there's a lot, lots of people to ask. Um, you know, just, just to be sure that you're treating the right disease. You don't want to use chemicals. Um, unnecessarily or, or that aren't effective um, but a key part of it is monitoring the crops regularly walking around the crops and spotting the potential problems um, you know, integrated pest pest management can have a big part of this um, with the knowledge of your crops you know from experience which potential problems are likely to come up and you can plan for those and biological products can work very well if you apply them in advance um, Traditionally, been used, you know, you know, um, for, for, for white fly control and things like that. But also, there's a new new range of fungicides available now, 
In fact, in fact we do one called pre-stop, and you know, they, they can be incorporated with conventional products um, to, to give you some background protection. So you know, there's lot, lots of options. Um, but the key thing is you know, learn from your previous problems and improve upon it. Uh, and that's a big, big lesson in life, I think. Um, so just, just a note about stewardship, really. Um, you, know, you can see the pressure that, that the pesticides are under in the market. You, know, you really need to be sure that you're getting the most up-to-date up advice you know, for specific crop protection products. And you know, everyone selling a pesticide these days is basis, you know, is basis registered. And um, there, there's been quite an update recently that some of the old grandfather rights have been taken away. So everybody now on the register is up to date and, and is maintaining the register and their skills. So you know, don't be afraid, afraid to ask a basis um, advisor for the best information. And they'll give you a balanced um, <coughs> information on what, on what, what, you know, what, you know, what, what the choices are, but, but obviously in a legal, uh, in, from a legal point of view. Um, another key part is application. Um, you know, we see it a lot. Um, it's really important to maintain your sprayer, um, know that you're applying it in the correct way, um, and there's lots of ways of keeping on top of that. Um, you, you know, there's an operator scheme, the Enrosa scheme, which a lot of people do, um, keeps them up to date and makes sure they're, they're doing the best application. More and more now, there's the NSTS um, sprayer testing. It's, it, you know, it's mainly on bigger sprayers, um, but there's lots of advice on knapsacks as well. Um, but it, but it's, you know, it's, it's a testing of sprayers, and all, all sprayers will have to be tested I think from the end of this year, but after the first five years of use. Um, but, but another thing, you know, follow the label. The labels can be quite difficult to read, but there's generally a reason why the label has, has certain restrictions. And, you know, that's, that's something important to follow. You know, if, if we're going to keep these, uh, these actives that we've got and potentially get new actives, we need to demonstrate that, you know, it's a safe environment, that they're applied in a professional way. Um, and I'm sure everyone, you know, would follow that. Um, and there has been voluntary initiatives, you know, to try and maintain the use of, of products. You know, things like slug pellets. There was a, there was an industry-wide um, scheme that, that helped to, you know, um, promote safe, safe usage of the products. So I think I think there's a lot, lot we can do. I know it's a big, big problem, but um, you know, we're all here to help. Um, any questions? There might be some questions. We're available on our stand afterwards if anyone wants to talk about anything particularly. We do have a pest damage questionnaire. If anyone would like to fill that in, it gives information for us going forwards on potential pests that need a target and how we can help. So we're happy to you know, fill those in. Uh, that would be great. Thank you very much.